All right. So we've talked about three things so far, right? That the heart that God is looking for is a heart that's open to be molded, right? And one of the best ways we can know the status of our heart is really how we deal with authority, <clears throat> because you're getting to the heart of rebellion when you can't deal with authority. And then hopefully we looked at really beginning to see the world through God's eyes of that, that people are valuable to him and everybody is valuable regardless. And the goal is to try to, to recognize and see the value that God sees in others. And then um, now we're going to talk about character and the role that character plays. And this is the third area that God really went to work in my life because, again, having grown up in such a dysfunctional home, I really didn't have a character, a foundation of character to build upon. And it's really hard to advance in power and responsibility if you don't have character. And every time I think this is really like a no-brainer, somebody does something that surprises me. So, like, we just had a guy arrested in my squadron for soliciting sex from an underage minor. Completely blew me away. Never, never saw it coming. And it's just amazing how many people get taken down by character flaws. Would you agree with me on that one? So as much as I'd like to say this is a no-brainer, I really don't think it is, and it wasn't for me as I continued on. So I put the blood up here, and I put some uh, character traits, because the blood, if you think about it, I pulled some cool facts for you. Did you know that blood diseases not only cause a lot of problems, but they can also lead to death if you get a blood infection? Isn't that amazing? What is more interesting is that they are rarely diagnosed in the early stages of development. So it can grow inside somebody until it's too late. Many people live for years, and they're not even aware they face the risk, and the many blood diseases can occur almost asymptomatic, revealing itself only in the later stages of development when it's already too late to do anything about it. Now, doesn't that really parallel kind of how character flaw is? Right? You don't really know you have character flossom until something comes that challenges you on it. And then by then, for a lot of people, it's usually too late. And the price they pay for that is amazing. And the damage that they get that occurs because of that. So here we go. We're going to look at Proverbs because I learned early on any time the Bible spends an exorbitant amount of time talking about something, it's probably pretty important, right? The New Testament, God talks about money a tremendous amount, right? We talked earlier with authority. It's a huge theme all the way through Scripture. Well, I think character growth is too. So I gave some people some Bible verses. So if you would, we'll just go down the list. These are just summations, but go ahead. Somebody take Proverbs 1.7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. All right. Next. How long, O naive ones, will you love being simple-minded? And scoffers delight themselves in scoffing, and fools hate knowledge. Well, next. The wise of heart will receive commands, but a babbling fool will be ruined. All right, next. Whoever loves discipline loves knowledge, but he who hates reproof is stupid. That's one of my favorites anytime the Bible uses stupid. <laughs> I find it. Next one. The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man is he who listens to counsel. All right, a couple more. The refining pot is for silver and the furnace for gold, but the Lord tests hearts. Someone read 1632 for me. He who is slow to anger is better than the mighty and he who rules his spirit than he who captures a city. And I think one more. Better is the poor who walks in his integrity than he who is crooked, though he be rich. And so I just took a sampling from Proverbs of, of character, but trust me when I tell you there's a lot more in there about character, and so I think it's safe to assume that character matters to God. And... If character matters, then it would stand to reason that would be one of the things we would focus on as Christians, right? Growing our character. Because Proverbs 27, 17 says what? 
as That's right. So it's very clear to me in Scripture that having our character developed and refined over time is a very biblical concept. The challenge I think we get into, the challenge we have as men, though, is most of us don't like to take correction. Maybe you're different, but I don't. When someone corrects me on something, my immediate human response is defensiveness. Maybe you guys are a little different, but I don't think so. I think all men kind of struggle with this area, especially if it comes from people we love, like our wives. Right? That can usually trigger a pretty good argument, at least in our home. But if you think about the refining of or the sharpening of iron, there's four things that occur whenever iron sharpened, right? I got them up there for you. One is the metal is heated really hot, so there's heat. And then you can see the guy pounding on it with a hammer. And then there's sparks, right, that fly. And what's the fourth thing? Friction. Now, if the Bible says that iron sharpening iron is like one man sharpening another, then we can probably, it's safe to assume that when we get sharpened by people we know, what four byproducts exist? (laughs) pounding heat friction, none of which we like. It hurts. Nobody likes to be told that I'm probably not the best dad in the world, or maybe I'm failing as a husband. Those are not easy words to hear. But I think they're necessary words to hear if we're going to grow and be used as much as as God could. So when I was dating Cheryl early on, I was a hot mess. And Cheryl, in a lot of ways, was much further ahead than me in social skills and being able to work a room and everything. So we would go to parties, and I wanted to grow so bad that I would have her make a list of all the things I did wrong at the party. And then on the way home, she would read them to me, and we would go over. (laughs) Well, I wanted to change so much, I was willing to do that. And I liked Cheryl, (laughs) and of course, I wanted to eventually marry her, so I had some motivation in that. But And that went on for years, that she would critique me on stuff, because I'm an auditory learner, uh, listener. Anybody in here an auditory listener? So one of the problems I have is when you speak to me, my natural inclination is to turn my head. That's what auditory listeners do. But it can be perceived as what? Not paying attention. So those are the things that I had to work on through my life, just some of the many to learn how to better communicate with people. But... It was the same on the character piece, too. So when I was studying in business and psychology, our counselor will probably appreciate this, when I ran across a guy by the name of Jahari. He was a psychologist, and I thought this window of his was probably the most profound thing I'd come across. And remember, I think it was you that was saying truth is truth, right? Regardless of who discovers it, it was our brother who's the counselor. What's his name? Scott. Scott. So what Jahari theorized is that humans have four windows in their soul. You have the open area, blind, hidden, and unknown. The open area is easy, right? That's what you know about me and I know about you. You now know that I'm married. I have four children. My wife is Cheryl. We live in... Those are all easy. Where it starts to get complicated is when it starts to get into the blind area, Because that stuff that I don't necessarily know I do, but other people do. And if we were to be honest, don't your friends know you do certain things that you might not be aware of or your wife? They just learn how to compensate for it because they don't want to bring it up to you because a lot of times it ends up in a fight. Well, that's the blind side. I have a ton of it still to this day. Then you have the hidden area, which is what I know about myself, but you don't know about me. And this is where we hide all those things, whether maybe it was an abortion, maybe we were molested, maybe we did something sometime in our... We're hiding it because we're embarrassed of it. There's still stuff I did when I was in Japan that I won't talk to anyone about. I'm just so embarrassed and ashamed of the stuff that I did. And I keep that hidden. And then you have the fourth area, which is really your unknown area. It's the triggers that you have that you might not know why when somebody does something. It's buried stuff, hard to get to, painful to get to as well. So Jahari theorized that the goal 
is the more you shrink those three areas, the more healthy you become. Now, isn't, isn't that the basis of inner healing? It's becoming free. And I can tell you from personal experience when I was working through all my stuff and you know, I was molested when I was a child, and that brought such pain to me. For years, I was embarrassed about it. But through inner healing, I got freedom from that. And it's amazing how before that occurred, that was a very sensitive, hurtful area of mine I was embarrassed of. But once God healed it, it's really no big deal anymore as far as the pain inside me goes. And so the more open we can become the more free we are, right? Cockroaches live in the dark. I mean, you've heard all the analogies before when you turn the light on. So I think the question that we have to ask is what? How do we do that? And that's a great question. And I think you do it, we do it by several ways. Number one, up in quadrant two, really the only way you can shrink your blind area is you've got to get feedback from people who love you. And that takes character. Because again, is it easy to be told we're not the stud muffin that we think we are. You see what I mean? It's not easy to hear. <laughs> but if we don't hear it, how do we ever grow? Right? If your wife, if, if Cheryl can't come up to me, which she does quite frequently, and say, Dan, you're spending too much time away from the kids, the family's suffering because of that. If I don't hear that, and if I don't change, you can know where that's going to take me in five to ten years. But because I'm open to it, I don't always like it, but because I've always given Cheryl permission to tell me that, I think it's one of the reasons why we have the family that we have. It's because when I spend a lot of time away, Kayla begins to act up, and Cheryl carries a huge burden of it, and it reels me back in. And I start, we start reprioritizing our schedule, and I start spending more time at home. How about others' observations? We do it at work all the time, right, with evaluations, doesn't your boss? What's our motive for getting feedback at work? To get a raise, compensation. But shouldn't it be the motive be to grow and become more like Christ, to become a better man so I can be a better husband, to become a better man so I can be a better father, to become a better man so I can be a better pastor? See, to me, that's the goal. The goal is to become better so that I can be better for God and he can use me in different areas. And then if we slide down into the hidden area, and I'll show you in a second where I think we can work on that, but that really takes friendship and trust. And this is part of the reason why I think men struggle in Bible studies. And I think women predominantly make up the majority of Bible studies in most churches. I know you guys have a very strong men's ministry, and I applaud you for that. It's pretty amazing. Most churches that I've been to don't. There'll be one or two men, and most of the people that come are women and females. And I think part of that is because men don't like to share a lot of personal stuff. That's very tough for us as men to do. And so you put me in a circle of eight or ten people, and you tell me to confide my deep, dark secrets Chances are, what? Not only am I not going to do it, I'm probably going to find a reason why I can't come to Bible study next Monday night, or whatever the case might be. And then finally, you get over into the unknown area, and if you're not a Christian, I don't know how they do it. I mean, we're blessed because we have the Holy Spirit to reveal those deep, dark secrets to us as He heals us and improves us, but I don't know for the life of me how secularists do it. I don't know where their hope lies to ever get healed from half of their stuff. So when you think about growing and opening your window, these are the three areas that I think really we have to develop relationships in. And if you notice down here in the left for the blind area, really the only thing we can do is trust our friends and our spouses to tell us the areas that we're weak in. That's it. Who else is going to love you enough to tell you? in a way that is truly has your best interest at heart. But we have to become people that are open to it and actually seek it out. Because the time to be a good father is not 
when your kids are grown, right? It's during the process of raising them. The time to be a good boss is when you're supervising and when you're actually doing it. It doesn't do any good if you've been retired for 20 years and then you figure out, man, I could have been a wonderful boss. And then you have the hidden area. Really, I think you need cell, friends, and scripture for that because to reveal the things that are really embarrassing to you, what does that require? A tremendous amount of trust. Because I have to trust you that you are not going to go blabbing that to somebody. And I tell you, that's another thing I think men struggle with is trusting other men to keep secrets, which is why a lot of men, I think, suffer in silence with this stuff and weakens our character and ultimately weakens our walk. And then finally, the unknown area, excuse me, is really only the Holy Spirit can do that. And that's an area of my life that I still don't feel like I've made much progress on. Because as far as I've grown from when I was a child or a teenager, I still struggle with anger issues. I still have very little patience sometimes for my kids. And those are things that I'm working on. Uh, and I just, I'm grateful that in God's grace, he protects my children from the damage that I could do to them. Sometimes when I have my volcanic eruptions because daddy's tired and it's been a very stressful week. So anyway, I think when we get ourselves in trouble is when we begin to isolate and we only rely upon one of those three pyramids, right? Do you hear people say, well, I feel the Lord is telling me to do this. Has anyone, you ever heard anyone say that? That's good, but what can it also be? A lie can be very, very destructive. And I can remember going to uh, singles groups, and you know how in singles groups they're like, yeah, the Lord told me I'm going to marry this guy. And then six months later they break up. And what do they say? The Lord told me to break up. And it used to puzzle me. I'm like, how does that happen? Maybe he changed his mind. So this is why it's so important not to neglect the friendships and the relationships of other brothers is because it's all we have to depend upon sometimes to keep us straight between what we feel the Lord is telling us or even what we read in Scripture. It's always good to have all three. And I think a healthy growth is when all three of those are strengthened and present in our lives. So here we go. The blind area. This is something I came up with when I was thinking about how you actually deepen in friendships. And if you can see up here, there's initiative, time, caring for others, and integrity. And the circle represents the progress towards making intimate friends. And if you notice on the outside ring, we have a lot of acquaintances. Those acquaintances move to friends. And then from friends, they move to close friends. And then if the process continues to work, they move to intimate friends, the ones that I can trust to reveal those things to. So the goal is to move into that area, but to do that, we have to do some things. And number one, we have to take the initiative to know people. Men have a tendency, too, to stand back in a corner a lot of times and not engage in relationships. Women naturally do relationships better than I think we do. But I know myself sometimes I don't need a lot of people, and it's very easy for me to just go months on end and not fellowship because <clears throat> I'm good. I don't really need it. But if I don't, I never get to the level of having intimate friends that help me grow. Number two, we got to work at not being the center of attention. For some of us, that's easy who are introverts. For the extroverts who love to be the center of attention, that's kind of hard. Because the class clown, they cut up, we do things, we have fun. But really, we've got to work at it because... Have you, anybody in here ever read the book, How to Win Friends and Influence People? Isn't that a fantastic book? What do we know about human nature? What's everybody's favorite subject to talk about? Themselves. Themselves. You want to be a great conversationalist? Just learn to ask questions. And as soon as you ask about someone's child or their job or their, their kids, what happens? You're in. They just glow because they love talking about themselves. And so to become a good friend, you really have to learn how to not let the attention be focused on us and begin to turn it on others. 
And that's where the friendship begins to develop. And here's where the character comes into play. You've got to develop trust and become trustworthy. What happens when someone confides in us and then we tell somebody? That is devastating. Has that ever happened to anyone? It's hard, isn't it? And, and once trust is destroyed, how easy is it to get back? I think it's virtually impossible to fully ever completely trust someone again, which is why character matters. Is because trustworthiness is a character attribute. And this is another hard one, I think, for guys, investing time in friendships and relationships. And it's not hard if it's revolving around sports. That's easy, right? We can go over to your house and we can watch a football game for three hours and eat chips. But that's not really strengthening and deepening the relationship. This is where things such as prayer breakfast, men's prayer breakfast, I think, comes into play. And retreats like this are so valuable because it gives us the time to get away and actually get to know people at a deeper level, which then ultimately starts to move us down into the area of intimate friends. And then isn't it interesting that when people pay a coach for something, they usually listen, right? Don't, don't we send our kids to like soccer camp and we pay hundred and what? How much do soccer camps, football camps cost? hundred bucks or something. Isn't it interesting we send our, our kids so a coach can help them become better and we pay big money for that? What if we were to treat our friends that we respected and liked the way we treat coaches and we actually listen to their advice? Now, it was a hard one for me, and I still struggle with it, but I try. And, you know, Proverbs says, in a multitude of counselors is where wisdom is found. And so over time, I have built a cadre of about four or five people that I trust, and almost every big decision that I make, I go to those people and seek their advice on it. Because I value them because of the life that they've lived and the experience that they have. So that's really how we deal with the blind area. Oh, and then you have to, of course, ask for feedback. So the hidden area, this also gets to what Scott was talking about today. You know, we don't like to be alone with our thoughts very much. Have you noticed that about society today? When most people are in the car, what are they listening to? Radio, music or talk radio. When they're out at the park, what are they doing usually? Checking their phone. We don't do well as a society anymore of getting alone with our thoughts. And I know for me, part of the reason, the big reason why I didn't like to be alone with my thoughts is I didn't like where my thoughts took me. It was just nothing but hurt, past, and all the bad stuff that I liked, that I didn't like. And so it's easier to drown that out. The problem is, if you're never alone with your thoughts... When do you really get to start working with the Holy Spirit on those thoughts and the hurts and the wounds? And then this was another big area for me is learn how to have communication with God open and honestly. You know, because having grown up in the Southern Baptist Church, God was this really big fiery being that sat up in his throne and sent people to hell. And I didn't have a father to figure out what a relationship or communication with God should be. So this was a struggle with me. But over time, I began to realize that God's big enough to handle it when I'm mad at him or when I'm angry. And so I started taking that to him. I would just say, God, I'm really mad at you. I don't understand. I'm not happy. <laughs> now, he never answered me, of course. But it, it, it was healing to me as a person to know that I could go to my Heavenly Father and, ex and when I'm afraid or if I'm scared or if I'm hurt, cry out. Get along with the Bible and do your own study. Good men's ministry helped that. But you know, a lot of people never crack their Bible. I didn't, but then I learned. And this is another hard one is being honest about your motives because we can cover our motives up pretty easily as men. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm just working hard for you, sweetie. I'm just trying to give more stuff to the family. That's the one I have to watch how much I work because the truth of the matter is I enjoy working because I enjoy the accolades I get for working. And when I'm at work, I just like it. In some ways, it's an escape for me. Not that I don't like my family. I love my family. 
But there's something about that that I just like. And I have to guard myself and, and be honest about my motives of why am I spending so much time away from the family. And then the last one I'll touch on is work at learning the difference between condemnation and conviction because there is a big difference, right? Condemnation is, has a tendency of what we do to ourselves and what others do to us where conviction really comes from the Lord. And for me, this was another big one because I had to learn what was the difference between me beating myself up and what was the Lord actually convicting me to change my way. But if you put all those things together... That really goes at how we can affect the inner healing side. And this is for Scott, too. The other piece up there is counseling. People wait way too long to go to a counselor. They really do. Um, and in the journey of getting whole, I think it has to be a priority. And then there's your inner healing and counseling for the unknown areas. Again, I think you have to be alone with your thoughts because you have to give the Holy Spirit an opportunity to actually speak to you and reveal things to you. And then the last one I'll touch on is five. You really, I, for me, I just ask God to change my character. That's what I asked him to do for me. Give me wisdom and change my character. Because I, I growing up in the South and in, in such a hypocritical environment, the last thing I wanted to do was be a hypocrite anymore. And I didn't want to just pretend like I was happy. If you see me happy, it's because I'm genuinely joyful in my spirit. If... I genuinely love people now. It's why I do half of what I do at work and other places and mentor is because God changed me into a person that genuinely loved others because I didn't like other people for a long time. I was very self-centered. <clears throat> and so I think a big part of it is just asking God to change you and then being willing to do what? Do it. Do it. And feel the heat, the sparks, the friction and the pounding that it takes to grow. And I do think this is why we I think this is why a lot of Christians are frustrated with their walk is because what is the one thing we always avoid? Pain and arguments, right? But what's the one thing God uses to grow us? Painful change. So if you avoid one, by default what happens? See what I mean? You def you avoid the growth. It's kind of like problems. You know how many people, like in business, people don't like problems, right? Guess the one thing, as you advance up in rank or you advance up in business, what's the only thing that really changes? The size of your what? Problems. So if you don't like problems and if you don't get good at solving problems, you unwittingly are limiting your career. Because people don't pay you to go up and pay you more money to solve smaller problems, right? Right? We advance to solve bigger problems. So it's the same way with growth. I think by avoiding the very thing that we don't like, which is feedback from other brothers, feedback from my wife, we're avoiding the very thing that God uses to shape and mold our character. All right, so here's the self-evaluation questions for you. Number one, do you challenge yourself each day to see how God is using your circumstances to grow your character? This is the essence of working with a bad boss because the tendency is when we work with, for somebody we don't like, what do we want to do? Leave. We don't want to stay there, right? But what if God has put you in that position just like David was put under Saul or Joseph was put in Potiphar's house knowing that he was going to be falsely accused so he could go to prison so he could sit there and learn more of what God had taught him to do. Imagine if he wanted to short-circuit that, how different the story of Joseph would be. Well, I think the same thing is true with us. If we're put in situations that we don't like, a lot of times I think it's so God can grow our character and challenge us and learn to submit. Number two, seek out feedback from your friends and your wife. I even try to seek feedback from my daughters and my children um, because sometimes children are some of the most truthful, truthful people on the planet. And a lot of the kids, you know, your children sometimes don't want to tell dad the truth because they're afraid of the response. 
But that's a very deadly cycle, I think, to get into. And so this is one of the areas I work with all my children is trying to get them to tell me how I'm doing in certain areas. And I, I think for Cheryl, too, it's pretty easy for me now. And then last one, do an honest assessment of how you respond when people give you feedback. How do you take it? Do you try to apply it? Or do you justify it away? And it's just doing an honest assessment of it. I'm not, because this, this is just what I think God uses a process. This is how the process works. And so if we want to grow to be used by God, we must let God go in and work on our character. And really, it's just a matter of being honest with ourselves and doing assessments. And finally, the application step, I tell you, is what's the one thing in your character that holds you back? And then begin to go to pray for that and ask God to change it. And it's the small things every day that over a long journey end up paying the biggest dividends. And so really, when I started in 1991, I had read a total of two books in my entire life. Today I stand here before you and I've probably read 300 or more. But at some point I had to start with the first book. But it was getting in the discipline of beginning to learn self-development and personal development that now over 30 years later has had a big impact in my life. I think it's the same thing with this. Going to work in each of those character flaws that we know that we have and asking God to work on it over time is how he changes and molds the character. All right? So anyway, that's it. Thank you.